there's not another town in this country that can boast of what we have here. And the reason for that is that Westport caught on as a place for illustrators to come years ago. And come they did, and they're all on these walls now. You live in a town that has a unique collection of artwork, and it'll never be bettered. You know who I am. Oh, yeah. You know who I am. I'm <laughs> Leonard Everett Fisher, and I've you're Howard of, Munz. I've correct? heard of you. Yeah, we've heard of each other. Uh, let's go back a little bit yeah. to the history uh, of this collection. Mm -hmm. Back in the, ninth, the late 90, or middle 1980s, uh, I was president of the library board. And for three years, I would conduct meetings in this room, the McManus room. And one Shirley Land, who was then president of the Friends, mm -hmm. would sit in the front row, audience of one, at these meetings. And one day, Shirley came over to me. She said, she said "How can you sit and conduct meetings in the, in the, looking at the bare walls of this room?" She said, "You've got to do something about these walls. It needs some art. It needs something." So for a couple of years, Shirley kept hounding me about these walls. You came along and came along with this idea that we ought to represent all of the artists in town, um, working artists, on the walls of this room. Mm -hmm. And that's how, right behind us, this wall took place. This collection yeah. began. The other condition was that I suggested that instead of having paintings in color, which there are many of around town, that this be a black and white show and that it be the work of the local illustrators mainly. When you say artists in connection with this room, we're not, and mostly we're not talking about painters, we're talking about commercial artists and illustrators. And that's what this wall is almost totally that's filled right. with. And uh, it was my feeling that because this town sees so much art and uh, their, their paintings in the main and from many different people of many different talents, that the, the fact that th this was the home of the illustrator, Westport, which was started with two, two painters, who, who, two illustrators who came here, one, one for a weekend and the other one who invited that man back for a weekend, George Wright and Ed Ash. That's how it began. And, um, and here is, all these years later, this is a fruit of that. One artist that comes to mind is Hardy Gramatke, who was an animator uh, at Walt Disney's. And uh, uh, he was very highly placed there. And he left Disney, became independent, became a book illustrator, and he did Little Toot, which has become a classic. The best known tugboat in Westport, <laughs> Little Toot by Hardy Gramatke. Hardy Gramatke. Yeah, that, that has been reissued again, I think, for the yeah. second or third time. This picture here, this little girl, this portrait of this little girl, won a, um, a vote one time uh, as being the most popular drawing of everything we have here by some of the most noted illustrators you've ever, ever known. Noel Sickles, who could do anything and did everything, he was a cartoonist to start with. He had a, he had a strip somewhere in the Midwest, and then he came east, and he w was seen regularly in Life magazine. So there's a little jolly picture of a chef. I don't know where he was and when he did that. But that brings us over to here. This is a woodcut by John Hell Jr., who is one of the best-known illustrators of anybody in my lifetime. He was the, um, the man who, after World War I, innovated the, uh, the flapper. And I don't know whether anybody here is old enough to remember that, but he was wonderfully successful, made a great deal of money, he was in everything, uh, the old Life magazine, Judge, and so on. And uh, so that's a woodcut. He did a series of those, too. They're kind of comic woodcuts. You don't see many of those anywhere. Jim Sharp, who drew, uh, he did the covers for the TV guy. Yes, he did a regular stint on that. He had a studio here in Westport. He was a Texan. Um, and a couple of years ago, he moved back to Texas. This is a comic strip, uh, John Prentice. Uh, I can't read the name of the, oh, it's called Rip Kirby. I remember that name. And uh, he did these strong black and white drawings. Uh, these men who did these strips work night and day, and they, if they weren't, if they didn't stay on schedule, they were fined. So they didn't take many holidays, and he's one who didn't. Barbara Gray, and this is a, an etching, a nude study, 
which she probably did in a sketch class. And now we come to Sophie Atchison. I guess that's a woodcut. This is Barbara Wilk, who was highly influenced by primitive art of all kinds. Suzanne Lemieux, an animator. And this is Nancy Riley, and it has gotten so good over the years. Nice going, gals. This is a, an odd thing, and it's done by Garrett Price, who was a, a cartoonist for The New Yorker. And this is totally uh, unlike anything else I ever saw of his. It's come kind of a weird imaginative thing of uh, these spooky roots coming out of the ground. I'm sure The New Yorker rejected that, but anyway, I find it a fascinating drawing. Let's see here. Chip Chadburn was part of a group of five illustrators and painters who had a whole building here in town for some years. Well, he was just a very good painter. He moved to Maine and uh, used Maine as his subject for the longest time. This is uh, Florence Tejanas. She married into the famous Tejanas family in Westport. It, everybody who was a Dahanas became an artist. And she only married into it, but she was very good. And we had that lovely little drawing of hers. I want you to see this. This is by Becky Boyer, Marilies, who was the daughter of uh, Ralph Boyer, who did the murals in the firehouse here, which were done for the Bridgeport Brass Company years ago on the subject of fire. She can do anything. And this is not typical of her style, but it's one of the many things she can do. This is a. Uh, Tom Armstrong, who was one of the uh, many people who, who came from the Disney studios years ago and moved to Westport. There was a whole influx of Disney people. And uh, uh, so this is just a little study of a, of a dog at rest. And here's a drawing uh, by Mort Rosenfeld. He's a man of many styles. This is one of Westport's most famous illustrators, Al Parker. You may remember he did a series for the Ladies' Home Journal called Mother and Daughter, and there were about seven of those. And this was, these appeared during uh, wartime, and it was always the mother and her about 11-year-old daughter dressed the same, doing the same thing, whatever it happened to be. Nobody had a greater reputation, and rightfully so, than Al Parker. So there you are, Al. Okay, here's a nice strong black and white by Arnie Bass. Here's a, an untypical drawing by Edna Icke, uh, which appeared in the New Yorker. It's untypical because she was noted for her covers. Uh, I've, I've heard that the editor of the, uh, of the New Yorker used to just refer, her to, to refer to her as, as the girl. He'd say, get me the girl for the next issue, and that was the girl. And this is one of a series by Al Wilmot who was uh, a wonderful commercial artist, and he could do everything from mechanicals to finished drawings, and he also painted on the side, though he wasn't noted for that. And he did a series of, of buildings in Westport in the business des district. There, I think there are about 15 in the, in the series, and this is a winter scene. This is an interesting one. It's by Walt Reed, who started out to be an illustrator, and has wound up being the illustrator's historian more and better than anybody else. He has a large business in New York, and uh, he collects old illustrations and, and sells them. Um, he was intimate with uh, all of the men that ever worked here and ever worked any place. He was just he was so fascinated by the, just by the existence of illustration. And he's the man you go to when you want to know something about anybody. This is Mike Gish, who was, uh, had a, he was in the Marine Corps, and he had a brother who was killed in the Marine Corps. And when the brother, when he learned that, he took his brother's name. And he's now a well-known painter in New England and, uh, and anywhere that he happens to live. He, I think he lives in Rhode Island now, but he was uh, a Westport native and uh, awfully good. Well, here's a fascinating man. Harry Beckoff. You see the size of these drawings? They're about an inch or an inch and a half tall. I was on the train with him one day going to New York, and I said, how are things going? And uh, he said, oh, pretty good. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this for Collier's. And I said, what do you mean this? And he reached in his pocket and took out drawings this size. And I said, well, they're, they're very nice, but what is it you're going to have? He said, these. 
I said, how are they used, possibly? And he said, well, they just blow them up. I said, well, why do you work that small? He said, because I like to. And <laughs> anyway, he did, and they came out full illustrations in Yadis. He's a great guy. This is a cartoonist, Mel Casson. Uh, he had several strips, and he also did uh, drawings that were not part of strips. Real strong thing. He was in several papers. This is untypical of this man, but there's nothing typical you can say about him. It's Steve DeHannes, who's probably, if you had to take a poll of who's the best no remembered artist in Westport, Steve DeHannes would be among them, uh, mostly for Saturday Evening Post covers. And this was an assignment to do a set of dishes with, with uh, historical backgrounds. And so this, the circle became a plate later, and uh, th there is a whole set of these. Stephen was the, the chairman of the Citizen Stamp Advisory Committee for the Postal Service. And because of Stephen and, and uh, one of his predecessors, who also came from this area, uh, 100, approximately 165 United States postage stamps were designed here in Westport. And you could think of a collection of stamps done by Westport Art. You're looking at two of them right here. I did that about 30 years ago. It's a scratchboard. But I've done some 6,000 of these things over a 25-year period, including U.S. postage stamps. That must that be a lot of stamps. dust you're working in. Oh, yeah. yeah. There was <laughs> but not that much, not that much. Tell me about yours. Oh, well, this is done by a guy named me. And uh, uh, I did this for uh, one of the local papers. Obviously, it, it had something to do with uh, either bagpiping or Scotland. And, uh, and there he stands. And, uh, it was in the uh, Greenwich News. That's the paper I did it for some years ago. Oh, here's a man that we both oh, work yeah. with. Uh, you, why don't you tell about Neil Hardy? Well, Neil is one of the foremost medical illustrators known internationally throughout the world. And uh, his drawings are extremely precise. I remember one time I had an earache and I was describing this to Neil over the telephone. <laughs> and he says, just wait a minute, I'm going to email you a drawing. And he <laughs> sent me a drawing of the inside of my ear, figuring <laughs> it would make me feel better. But it was just a gorgeous drawing. Mm -hmm. This is uh, Robert Lawson, uh, after whom the, uh, the Rabbit Hill Book Festival for the Westport Public Library is named. And he is the only artist ever in the United States to win both the Caldecott Medal and a Newbery Medal, which is a national award. When Lawson first came to Westport, uh, it was in the 1920s, uh, around 1922, 23, somewhere mm -hmm. in there. And the house that he moved into is where the Tavern on Main is now, the restaurant. This is one of the very early Westport illustrators, Ray Prohaska. He left Westport early and moved to uh, Amagansett, Long Island. In addition to being a fine illustrator, he was a great fisherman, and that was his first love, as a matter of fact. And happily, we got this, this rare drawing of his. Randall Enos, this is a nice, happy surprise, because in the New York Times, there was a full-color Randall Enos, and that's typical. Mostly, you would see him in color, but he had a unique style, and I think this is a first-rate thing. In any case, here's Arnie Copeland, who, something he did in art school on the West Coast, and uh, this showed such promise, it's such a fine thing, this etching, and uh, mostly they didn't teach etching in art schools, but they did with him. In any case, he came east and worked as an art director in several big agencies, then he finally had his own. This is Robert Halleck, who's better known as a graphic designer. That's what he mostly did. He was the designer of a wonderful magazine called Lithopinion, that appeared in New York some years ago, full color. It was done for the printer's union, so they got the best of anybody's printing. Leslie Randall, <coughs> this Leslie was a lady, Leslie, and um, she, uh, she loved to do animals. She was an old personal friend, and uh, I correspond with her daughter still, who has a farm in Vermont, and is an artist too, and a very good one. Speaking of very good ones, this is Amos Sewell, you see what a lovely, strong drawing this is. He worked in charcoal all the time, and that's typical of what he did. Saturday Evening Post was the place that <coughs> you were apt to find him. And this is Ted Giavis. 
it's an admirable drawing. This this may be scratchboard. I'll, I'll check with my friend Len later. If it's not, it's a pen and ink, but it, it almost looks like one. Here's Tom Funk, and this is untypical of him too. The New Yorker used him for everything, mostly for maps and small sketch, small uh, spot drawings. But he, he broke out of that and did this big, lovely tugboat. When Bernie Fuchs arrived from Detroit, where he was a star in the automobile business, he just knocked the socks off everybody in town. When I say everybody, I don't mean men in the street, I mean the established illustrators. They had never seen anything like the, his innovations. This is so untypical of him. Uh, but if you want to look somebody up, be rewarded. Look up Bernie Fuchs. He's also a first-rate golfer. Here's an interesting piece. I'm sorry I don't know the name of the artist or what to call the picture, but I do admire it. This is Eric von Schmidt, who gets special attention because he was one of the two sons of Harold von Schmidt, who was one of the all-time graphic heroes in this town. Way up top here, we have Gordon Mellor. He was a wonderful artist from the West Coast who could do anything, paint, draw, do cartoons, do one of anything. We used to kid him, or at least I used to kid him about when he married the girl from the art supply store. I ne never have to buy magic markers again. Anyway, he got them for free after that. Here is uh, Albert Hubble, who was a New Yorker artist and did, he, he didn't do cartoons as such, but it's a kind of a cartoon-like drawing. It's a little mixture of everything in here. And he was uh, used all over the New Yorker. This is a unlikely drawing by one of Westport's better known illustrators and painters and muralists, and it's Robert Lambden. His stuff is all over the place in the, both the banks in Westport and in Saugatuck. And most important of all is the great big mural in the library upstairs. That's his. Arthur Shillstone is, is somebody that you should know. I have come to know him very well recently. He could draw and he, could, he can paint and he can do one of anything. He had a, a show up here in the, in the library a while back. Lee Gustafson was a, an all-around illustrator. He especially liked golf. As a matter of fact, he, the illustration used to intrude on his golf time, but he managed to get them both in somewhere along the way. And this is his friend Tracy Sugarman, who now spends more time writing than he does artwork. And he's very happy to do it. He's a marvelous guy, a wonderful citizen, and um, can't say enough about this. He has written four books so far, and uh, others will come. Ro Halper, she does one of everything, starting with uh, woodcuts, and she teaches, and she saw to it that local artists got more of a show recently than they had for a while at the art center. And uh, so she's a, she's a powerful gal. And this is Barbara Rothenberg. She can continually changes her styles and doesn't settle for any single one. This is a, a, a lovely, funny, accomplished drawing by John Russo. Um, it speaks for itself. There's nothing I can add except it's just so delightful and it's so rewarding. Good for you, John. And now we come to Nancy Prevost's drawing of her father. I didn't know the gentleman, but I mean, he has to look like this. He couldn't have done otherwise. And this is Lucy Selleck, who is a great experimenter. Now, this stuff along the top is not part of the technique. It's just where she ripped it out of the pad and uh, made use of it that way. And this is a man named Thornton Oots. If you can say his name, I'm pleased that I can again. Thornton lived here for some years. He was a, 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 a very popular illustrator all over the place. Uh, he was a southerner. And one of the things that happened to him in his later life is that uh, President Jimmy Carter came to know him and his work. So he did several portraits of the Carter family. Let's come down here. This is a wild drawing you have to see as close as I am by Bert Dotson, who was part of the group of five or six artists who took over an old building in Westport and uh, made a studio of it. And uh, it was called Studio Five. And they, they cooked for each other every day. Lunch and to be invited to lunch there was a treat, I can tell you. And uh, he has since moved to Vermont. He's done several books. He's a marvelous draftsman. And if you could see this up as close as I can, you would agree. Uh, 
lovely guy. And now we come to Mike Mitchell. He was as good a draftsman as anybody ever saw. He was very instrumental in all of the stuff that was done for the famous art of schools. Um, then he finally moved to the West Coast and uh, where he started to teach at the Disney School. He was revered by his students. I know that from everybody who was ever out there and, and could quote. And uh, this is just a, a typical, it, 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 you have to get up close to know what this is about. This is what he, he drew so well. This is a crab taken apart, just to see how a crab was when he was taken apart. That's the kind of thing he sometimes, he could do anything ever. And that's Mike Mitchell to be revered. And this is untypical of Austin Briggs. It's, it's an etching, he didn't do that very often. He did things on the side. He was a very gutsy illustrator and a, a first rate one and, and a noted one. And uh, part of the famous art of school, he was one of the 10. Susan Swan was part of famous schools. Was a, she was an attractive gal that lived here. And, uh, she did, uh, could do realistic drawings and cartoons and uh, was part of famous schools. Something that really got the name of Westport th uh, known throughout the country was the famous art of school, which was a correspondence school that was started by Al Dorn and Fred Ludekens, two very well-known illustrators. And uh, they signed up 10 people. We'll start with Norman Rockwell and then and nine more all very successful illustrators and, uh, and big names. And now we come to Alex Ross. This is just a, a pencil sketch. I don't know, it was on the way to being a, an illustration, I'm sure. Uh, he had, holds the record still for having done more good housekeeping covers than any other illustrator. This is a drawing of Victor Dowd who had many styles and this is one he did while he was in the army in, in uh, Europe. This is a, a lovely drawn abstraction by Connie Kiermaier, who uh, has always been an experimenter. And in the last several years, she taught herself carpentry. And here we have George Wright, who was the first, remember this, the first illustrator in Westport. And this is Eve Donovan, who has left Westport for a while and now works on the West Coast. And here is one of the all-time great, you might not know it from this simple little drawing of a mother and child, but Henry Raleigh was one of the, considered by other artists at the time, and still, as one of the premium illustrators that ever comes through this town. If you name a half a dozen famous Westport illustrators, he was one of them. And here's the, the girl who invented other girls, Ann Chernow. She has done a series of, of girls, period girls, and their dress will show the period. I, they are all movie stars and, uh, and gals in odd outfits at the time. And she's been doing that for some years now and does it very well. She's best known for those. Bert Chernow, a marvelous guy. He, he also is as good a writer. He was a cartoonist. He's one of everything. Has done about five books. Great guy. And he's mostly now known, and rightly so, as the uh, originator of the Westport School Collection. Eric Gurney, who was <laughs> a wild man, a cartoonist for Disney, uh, a character out of Characterville. He always had one animal chasing another. That's Eric Gurney, everybody will tell you about him. Bob Skemp could do almost anything. He, he did a whole series of 24 sheet posters. They were the big outdoor posters that we used to see. And uh, he also loved things of the sea. Here we have Ralph Boyer, this is an etching, and uh, he lived in Westport his whole life and recorded many parts of it, and there's something at the beach. Here is uh, Jack Kovach. I'm at a loss to know where to start. He's just so versatile. This would be typical of his design sense, and uh, most of the things he does are more figurative than this. Cynthia Wilson, this is a, a, a figure drawing. It looks to me like it was taken in a life class and she needs, a, she needs a rest. Her elbow must be very sore by that time. Here's Paul Rabu, and he's very much, uh, uh, it's very right that we be talking about him today because uh, one of the last shows upstairs in the, in the regular gallery was the, 
the, the work of Paul Rabu, and it wasn't this kind of realistic thing, it was uh, his abstractions. One of the things he did, his wife had told me, when he would fin be finished working on a commercial job, he would have a tray full of paint that he hadn't used for that. So instead of washing it off, throwing it out, he would then do an abstraction with the paint that was left. And they were very good abstractions. And here's Tom Lovell, one of the great ones. He was, he was not part of the famous schools, but he was famous everywhere else. And uh, he, he, he did all kinds of uh, projects for uh, National Geographic. It was said to be the toughest clients anybody ever knew. They insisted on everything being done and done over. Any case, when he, uh, when he had a, a historical job to do, if he couldn't find the proper scrap for it, he made them. He made, he made swords and he made whatever the thing called for. What has taken place today with the computer and the totally different way commercial art is done, and there's some commercial, it's not to say commercial art isn't used, and editorial art is too, but it's nothing like what was happening in the days that these pictures were made and the men and women who made them are no long, mostly no longer exist. So it's, it's a piece of history too. Norm Tate was a, uh, an animator at Disney and uh, he had space here in town and uh, he's an old friend. I work with him in a couple of different agencies and this was just a, uh, a uh, one one drawing for one of a zillion drawings that would have come uh, for Pinocchio. That's some sly looking guy in Pinocchio. And this is John McDermott, somebody I was very close to, who was a, he was a, a correspondent in the Marine Corps in the Second War. He, uh, he drew beautifully. He was as interested in film as he was in drawing. Enid Monroe, uh, this is just so well drawn. It's a simple subject, but so nicely done. Now we come to one of the great ones, Harold von Schmidt. Every realistic illustrator in town, when they had a problem, a drawing problem, especially with animals, would call Vaughn, and he would straighten them out in a short time. He was revered by, by everybody. And uh, he could do animals in any way possible, and horses especially. And this is Jean Grally, a children's book writer and illustrator. A line drawn by Susan Malloy, who loves to do these architectural fragments of things. Uh, she, she does nature, things from nature and this sort of a thing. And this is Alberta Cifolelli, who is a, it's interesting to see something in black and white for, with her because she's such a colorist. And she works uh, with everything, but a very accomplished artist. Bernard Saunders, it's an etching that looks good to me. Herzl Emanuel, who is really a sculptor, has done a lot of things uh, in the past. Uh, he has a studio in Paris and, uh, and one in Westport. This is a little southern lady, Jean Woodham, who's a sculptor, and she works <laughs> in a studio that had to be built for it that would take the size of the girders that she worked on. I was at a house one time when a big truck came ram rambling up the driveway, and it was from U.S. Steel. They were deli <laughs> delivering <laughs> <laughs> a material for the thing she was working on. And this is, uh, just as you see, uh, an abstraction, but you can see the sculptor in it. And here's somebody whose name will be known to you. Ward Brackett was very successful, as was his wife, Dolly. Uh, they worked as a team on, on some occasions, and he did uh, handsome people. And this is Robert Galt, a watercolorist who's part of the well-known Galt family from Westport. And this is Lev Purdy, who was a commercial artist. Uh, he loved to draw and he was good at it. And uh, he had a, a family that, that followed the arts. There's another Purdy here. That's, that's one of his daughters. She was a fashion artist. Uh, he was, uh, I worked in an agency with him where he was a sketch man. And you can see how well he could draw. And then we come to Fraser Purdy who was a member of, of the Purdy family, he became the head art director at Young and Rubicum, the famous agency in New York, and he became an etcher, and this is what he did. And here's a, a slight study of a nude by um, Rita Edelman. And Diane Alexander, a Yale product, and uh, this is an experimental 
piece of hers. Here is Lynn Sweat, who had a uh, comic strip and a series of books. They were very popular, and that's what he did for the longest time. And here is Estelle Margolis, who has many techniques, and this is, happens to be a charcoal one. Here's a person that was so successful and so famous in his, in his field. It was, his name was Carl Erickson, but he signed his work Eric, and there it is. And I had got this little fragment of a drawing for his. He set the tone for fashion drawing forevermore. Nobody was better than him, or as most people were not as good. But that's the little fragment that the art director at, at uh, one, of the, uh, one of the department stores gave me one time. He was throwing it away. And I saw him doing it. Then I saw that, and here he is. And it's nice to have him part of it. So that's our, that's our show, folks. Most of the people on these walls are not only illustrators. There are many of them are painters, printmakers, uh, graphic designers. What's represented here is a span of about 80, 90 years. So this isn't just a show that happens to be going on. This is a special thing in this country. And, and Westport, which was known as, a, as an art colony, uh, has certainly had it proved with, with the collection of these talented people.